Deputy Chief of the Air Force, friends, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure to be standing here uh, as the inaugural speaker in the inaugural uh, seminar that we have organized. Uh, since time is limited, I will get straight into what I wanted to talk about in terms of air power and national security. 25th July 1909 is a date that very many people may not really uh, have an idea of what happened. An event of very little known uh, or very, very under-celebrated took place on that day. The genesis for that event was uh, first of a series of aviation prizes sponsored by the proprietor of the London Mail, Lord Northcliffe. A thousand pounds offered in 1906 for the first person to fly across the English Channel. And at the narrowest point of the English Channel from Calais to Dover, the distance was only 22 miles. On, in, in July 1909, three years after the prize was announced, three people tried to uh, cross the channel, and only one succeeded. Louis Blériot, an aviation enthusiast who had been building and crashing a number of aeroplanes between 1900 and 1909. And uh, although his wealth uh, was almost completely depleted by 1909, enthusiasm to be up in the sky continued to make him do uh, kind of foolish things. On 25th July, it took off from Calais at 4.35 in the morning, and once again crash landed at 12 minutes past five uh, near the Dover Castle. As an aside, uh, the quintessential uh, British bureaucracy. As soon as he crash landed, within about 10 minutes time, there was a customs officer there with a form for him to fill up, that you need to fill this up. And unfortunately, uh, he had a problem because there were no boxes to be ticked for pilot and for aeroplane uh, in that form that was given to him. So he described himself as the master of a yacht named the monoplane. And that is how he was permitted to stay on uh, in, in, in England. The implications of the flight, which was only 22 miles uh, long, much lesser than what artillery shells can be fired today, uh, was enormous for aviation as well as for the concept of national security. Lord Northcliffe uh, told the journalist who was going to write up in his paper about this, the famous words, that Britain is no longer an island has to be the theme of what you write. And that particular uh, small sentence actually ended the traditional reliance on sea power and land power for national security. Nothing was an island anymore which could be protected from uh, invasion by uh, fencing yourself off. So that was the first one. And uh, a bit over a hundred years after that historic flight, air power and national security seems to be inseparably intertwined, enmeshed within each other. And uh, I have gone out on a limb. In the program, if you look, uh, you will see that my, my topic is uh, written as, there can be no national security without air power. Now, I've done that uh, consciously. Uh, essentially, if you agree with me, you will have to think as to why it is so. And if you don't agree with me, you will have to think even more as to why and how you can refute that statement. So essentially, that provocative statement was put out there just to make anyone who looks at it think a little more. And uh, it may sound a bit brash. It may sound a bit biased. But the statement actually is a little, it's, it's to be looked at in a slightly nuanced manner. Uh, I'm not claiming that air power alone will provide national security. No, far from it. But what I'm trying to state is that without adequate air power, complete and assured national security is not possible in the contemporary world. So the statement that I put out there has to be viewed in this uh, form. So the operative words is national security and air power. 
what I intend to do in the next 20 minutes before Tom throws me out of the lectern is to briefly examine the concept of national security because that's something that we have to understand before we can say that AIPA is going to be uh, effective in creating national security. And then explore the criticality of uh, uh, AIPA in achieving uh, national security at the strategic level. So what is national security? Very briefly, the concept originated uh, from the Peace of Westphalia in 1648, which were a series of treaties that ended the 30-year war uh, in Europe. What it did was to recognize the exclusive sovereignty of a state over its land, its peoples, and its agents abroad in a very broad manner. And this continues to be the basic philosophy that underpins the international order of nations as we know it today. Now, national security continued to be a very academic concept uh, till about the late 20th century. The first time this term was used was in the Yale University in 1790, not in common usage, but in one of the uh, articles that was published. And then uh, in a geostrategic environment, it was first used by the United States when they passed the US National Security Act of 1947. By 1960s, there was general acceptance that national security actually is a wider concept uh, than the mere defense of the borders of the nation uh, across, across the world. The geographic borders of the nation were important, but national security meant something much more than that. It's very difficult to, to define national security. The, it's, there is no universally accepted definition for this. And the variations in national security definitions that different nations tend to believe in uh, also indicate the different interpretations that national security has. Uh, it's an ambiguous concept, definitely. And in its very simple form, you can say it is freedom from military threat, that is physical destruction, and political coercion. And when you increase the sophistication of this concept of national security, you bring in non-military security like human dignity, freedom of speech, freedom from biased <laughs> prosecution, et cetera, in a contextual manner. So that's the other side of the spectrum if you really have uh, to look at national security as a spectrum. A very early definition in 1943 by a theorist called Walter Lippmann, he uh, talked about uh, national security being this, a nation has security, et cetera, et cetera. But basically, if you look at it, you will realize that the influence of World War II, in 1943, the World War II was uh, at its peak. So the influence of that kind of a war is very apparent in this. The concept continued to evolve uh, by bringing in elements of coercion. And by the 1960s, the subjectivity of the concept separated from the objectivity of the concept of security itself. The idea of the acquired values of a nation having to be, purported, uh, to be uh, protected was brought in. And by the 1980s, you find <coughs> that economic security also started to be considered as part of national security. The need to safeguard uh, the kind of, or the type and the nature of government that one has, the national institutions that one has, they came into, uh, into the national security equation. And uh, in the 1990s, the evolution continued where national security started being viewed with, within the lens or through the lens of the ability of a nation to do something. And that, I believe, was the beginning of this concept of intervention in places where uh, stability was being questioned. And uh, in uh, 2010, uh, President Obama uh, brought out this concept of national security interests as opposed to the concept of national security itself. So two separate things, national security interests could actually spread like a ripple across, uh, uh, across the, the oceans. And uh, the other thing that uh, the, the president brought out was the question of respect 
for universal values, which I believe is a moralistic stand or a moralistic tilt towards the national security objectives. So respect for universal values. Whose values? What is universal values? It's never been defined, and it's still an ambiguous concept. So national security, what I wanted to bring out here was that national security now uh, encompasses such a wide variety of things that anything and everything can be swept under that huge carpet, national security. And uh, just to uh, give you an indication of what we think about as national security, the strategy for Australia's national security, which was released in February 2013, had to say this. Now the, uh, the italics on the slide uh, I have inserted because that unified national security system is what we have to talk about when we talk about uh, national security for ourselves. <coughs> in fact, it's a very interesting, uh, as an aside, uh, I was giving a presentation to the uh, Indonesian Air Force a month ago, and uh, they were all senior officers, colonels and above, almost 100 of them. And uh, the main thing that they picked up when I put this up on the slide was the, the, the fundamental questions that they had to ask was how are you going to shape the world in Australia's interest? So that is something that we have to really think about. How, how, how does one go about doing that? So the question of unified national security system is what I want to address now, because uh, we need to know what are the elements of national power. So a unified national security system actually means a whole of government approach to national security. And when you say a whole of government approach, these are the main elements, uh, diplomatic, economic, information, and military power of a nation. Now these four, you can look uh, at the uh, lower part of it. They are supported by other factors, demographic factors, natural resources, military capabilities, et cetera, et cetera. It is not that one particular thing like the geographical factors only affects the economic uh, power of a nation. No, it could be contributing to all four. And why these four? Because most of the elements or most of the national power factors can be pushed within these four. And so it becomes easier to really deal with uh, national security, to create a strategy, and then to achieve national security objectives. The other thing that I want to uh, definitely point out is that the military power of a nation is only one part of the elements of national power, as opposed to what it used to be maybe even just about 50 years back, where uh, national power is considered uh, pretty much resident in the military forces of the nation. So the military power actually functions in three domains, as you know, air, land, and sea. For this particular presentation, I'm discounting space and uh, cyber as something extraneous to what we have to discuss uh, in terms of air power. And the contribution of any one of these elements is based on the strategies that have to be put in place. <coughs> and in terms of which element of this national power will have the lead when a particular strategy is being employed, which will be the supporting elements, this will continue to vary if you have a truly whole of government approach to looking at national security. It's only when you do not have a clear understanding of what is a whole of government approach to national security that you find the military placed in places where it should not be, in situations that it is not capable of really controlling fully, and then we say, oh, the military has failed. So, I would suggest that that kind of a situation is there only because we do not, as a nation or as an entity, completely understand what is the whole of government approach. That's the first one. So when you're talking about national security, the next question from the military side would come, what do you mean by national power? What is national power, uh, national air power? So I really don't want to uh, discuss national, uh, I mean, the, the question of what is air power 
here in this this audience. But uh, allow me to put up a definition of national air power: the sum total of a nation's capabilities that can be employed to achieve its objectives through the medium of air. Now, it comprises aviation and aviation-related resources that can be employed in the pursuit of national objectives. It encompasses all elements of aviation, that is civil aviation, commercial aviation, military aviation, indigenous aviation-related industries, and associated research and development. The support facilities required to have air power. All this put together is national air power. And now this national air power is the one that will be employed within the strategies of national security. And so, what are the national security strategies that you have? The basic four national security strategies start from influence and shape, deterrence, coercion, and punishment and destruction. Now, what I want to emphasize here is that this is not an incremental process that you have to start at influence and shape when you want to employ a particular strategy. You can try, start at the other end, punishment and destruction, if necessary. But what we have to understand is that whatever we do, at the end of it, we come back to post-conflict stabilization activities, which is actually influence and shape. So it's actually a cycle of strategies that we're talking about. You can start at any point in the cycle, but you have to come back to the post-conflict stabilization activities. This is one thing that the Western world has failed to do uh, in the last uh, decade or so, or more than a decade. And the failures of why we haven't done it, or the failures associated with the fact that this has not been done, is there for all of us to see, especially in the Middle East. So this is the spread of uh, uh, strategies that can be employed. You can also employ two strategies simultaneously. Two elements of national power applying two different strategies simultaneously. So this is a very complex situation in the sense that at the strategic level of decision making, it has to be decided what are the strategies that we are going to apply, who's got the lead in what, who's going to support what, how this support and lead will change, if necessary, while the strategy is still being <coughs> applied. And this is where, actually, air power comes into its own. Because air power has uh, essentially uh, five key functions. These are the five key functions that air power does. It obtains and maintains control of the air. I will go into that a little bit in detail a little later. The other three things is to know, shape, and respond. And the last one is alignment, which is alignment with uh, national security objectives laid down at the political level. So when you talk about control of the air, what we need to do is to understand that control of the air is a prerequisite for anything else to happen. And unfortunately, once again, in the, in the Western military, uh, operational uh, ethos, the control of the air is now being kind of considered as a given. It's being assumed that it will always be there. Unfortunately, that's not the case. We have been operating for the last 15 years in uncontested airspace, having complete air supremacy. The day it gets questioned, believe me, we will all be running up and down because we have got so so used to doing what we feel like in a benign environment. So all this use of drones and uh, UAVs or UCAVs or whatever you want to call them, we will really have to start worrying about. So this assumption of control of the air is something that uh, we should not have. Control of the air can also be uh, in terms of different levels, air supremacy, control of the air, favorable air situation, et cetera, et cetera. <coughs> The question of no, the situational awareness. All national security initiatives are intelligence driven. There's no doubts about it. Unless we know that there is a threat to the nation, how are we going to react? How are we going to respond? Whether it's preemptive or not is immaterial. But the fact is it's all intelligence based. And the question is of the Ouda loop, 
observe, orientate, decide, and act, which has to be faster than that of the adversary. So I'm talking about relative speed. I'm not talking about the fact that we have to make instantaneous decisions, no. So once again, to know what is the order loop time frame of the adversary, you need intelligence. You need to have situational awareness. Once again, I'm not going to go into the details of data collection to information to knowledge to decision superiority. You know, we can, we can discuss that till the cows come home. But the fact is, the ODA loop, which is fundamental to success when you are carrying out an operation, is completely dependent on this factor of no, of uh, intelligence. And uh, there is, uh, I must admit, there is a, a recent tendency to, to replace this observe and orientate in the ODA loop with knowledge. That's not so. It cannot be done. Knowledge is not observe and orientate. Even if you put those two together, it's not knowledge. And uh, the next one that I want to talk about is shape in terms of influence and manage. All air power capabilities can be used to shape the environment. And then you come to respond, which is creating effects, both kinetic and non-kinetic. Kinetic effects uh, through uh, precise, proportionate, discriminate uh, strikes. Non-kinetic effects through show of force, uh, forward deployment, enforcing uh, no-fly zones, et cetera, et cetera. This is the other side of the fence. What I want to talk a little more in this three minutes that I've got is about alignment. First thing that we have to know, alignment of all the actions that air power or the military or the diplomatic corps does has to be aligned with the political end state. End state has to be decided at the political level. And uh, all actions from the tactical to the strategic level must be aligned to meet that political end state. And this selection and maintenance of aim resonates throughout history. Whenever it has gone skewed from the political aims, the application of any element of national power has not achieved the results that we wanted. And air power in the past two <coughs> decades have become the most uh, often used as a first choice weapon. And in many ways, it has been used as an arbitration tool uh, in emerging conflicts. Therefore, it is all the more important that the application of air power becomes aligned with the national objectives. The other thing I want to put forward in this forum is that Air Force actually, which is the repository of all air power capabilities, or most of the air power capabilities of a nation, uh, is an envelope force. And it has a dominant role to play both in conventional warfare as well as in hybrid warfare. Uh, it is an offensive capability, and it requires very limited contextualized training, unlike other arms of the military, to operate, whether it's in a conventional war or in a hybrid war. The tactics, to a certain extent, might be changed, but the basic training of the Air Force remains the same. That's an advantage that we have. The, uh, other point that I want to bring out is that an Air Force by itself must always be preparing for war. Uh, if we are not doing that, we are not doing the nation, uh, the, we are not providing the nation with the right service that is required of us. We can be saying that we are operating in benign environments. We have to be preparing at all times to be fighting a high-end war. It's much easier to ramp down than to ramp up. That's one thing. And you can see this, if you, if you really read, just read the newspapers, you can see this. What is China doing now? It's preparing for war. I'm not saying that they're going to declare war. But its armed forces are being oriented <coughs> towards fighting a war at the high end. You can see it every day in the newspapers. The question that we have to ask ourselves, are we doing it? I can say 70%, maybe? But we have uh, 
a problem with our operational art. That is the efficient application of high-end air power. We are not concentrating enough on that. And once you do not have sufficient depth in our operational art, our professional mastery will suffer. And because of that, we will not be able to connect to the national security objectives. I'm just saying that if these failures take place, I'm not saying that the failures are already taking place. So that's the question of uh, envelope power. Now, before Tom throws me out, uh, and perhaps it's not in good form to quote oneself uh, in, in a presentation that one is giving, but I wrote this sentence uh, five years ago, and I thought it encompasses everything that I wanted to say here today. Thank you very much. Time now for your questions. If you would just, uh, when the microphone comes to you, if you would uh, let us know who you are and to whom you belong, it will help us for purposes of the recording. So wait till the microphone comes to you because we need it for the recording purposes. Uh, while the microphone's going out, can I put it to you, Sanu, one of the problems is that when national security was defined as the protection of the continent and the offshore islands, it was easy to prepare. Is the problem now national security is it's Mabo, it's the vibe, it's everything, and therefore Australia hasn't got a clue what really, really matters and what it really ought to prepare for because it's preparing for so many contingencies that'll never happen that we get dragged into things of which we have marginal interest, but we don't know that. I, uh, I completely agree with what Tom is saying. Firstly, <laughs> firstly uh, the, the question of national security or the definition of national security is, like I mentioned very briefly, it's, it's now uh, a one size fits all kind of a situation. And uh, whether a nation should get involved in issues that are only of marginal interest to it or not is probably not a decision that is to be made by any of the elements of national power. It has to be made at the strategic level of uh, political decision making. What we can do is to influence that decision making by giving the right advice, frank and free, or fearless, whatever we want to say. Um, but from an air power perspective, uh, we face the issue or the challenge of being the one that is asked to go in first, probably the one that is going to come out last uh, whenever there is, an, uh, there is a conflict situation. Whether it's humanitarian assistance and disaster relief on the one end, or really high-end warfare on, on the other. It's invariably air power elements that go in first, which uh, has its own advantages in one way, but I think that it's fraught to the danger of failure if we are not really uh, capable of doing what we are being asked to do. Thank you. Your question. Hi. Oh, you're right. Here you go. Yeah, Hasanu, Squadron Leader Trav Hallam from 10 Squadron. Uh, my question rolls in from the previous one. Do you think that air power has been a victim of its own success insofar as national security, uh, referring back to uh, DCAF's comments about the rise of populism, particularly in American politics, where because air power has been so successful in essentially bloodlessly achieving national interests and national aims, it's become that first option choice and sometimes there have been unattended consequences. Where like going back to Elliot Cohen's thing about the uh, relationship between modern courtship whereas gratification without commitment. Do you think particularly with the rise of automation, et cetera, where we're actually going to a level where we can actually have zero casualties from our own forces, that we will see air power used without the consideration, without that sort of forward thinking? And tying into that, what is the airman's role in shaping the, uh, the government's perspective on that, where we're actually trying to advocate the fact that we may not be able to achieve everything that they want. Yeah, uh, the question of being a victim of our own success. What, I, 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 I believe that what we are not projecting to the political masters is the fact that for the last 15 years we've been operating with nobody shooting at us. We've got the facility to 
float around wherever we feel like, in whatever kind of speeds we feel like, with almost no self-protection necessary. And then also, if you're going to do a strike, you look at a target and say, I don't know whether that should be struck, so let me check with somebody else. Uh, or maybe we can go land and come back 10 hours later to hit the same target. I can assure you, when somebody else is starting to fire at you, you don't have those uh, luxuries. And I believe that we are not letting the political masters understand that if we come up against even a little bit credible opposition, we will start losing people and assets. And so then like them away. we got to advise them. We've got to tell them. Now we've got this Air Force which everybody thinks oh, we're superlative. We're great. I mean, like what Raf said, uh, no casualties, absolutely zero. I'm sorry, that's not going to last. It is not going to last. Go into the South China Sea and see what happens. See how many come back. I know it's like saying, doom saying, doomsday sayings, but these are facts of life. We go in, we, today, we are very, very proud of the fact that we could take our own whole unit with an air to a refueler, evacs, uh, combat elements, everything, and deploy ourselves. Try doing the same thing in a hostile environment. We will lose all of them. And this is the awareness that we have to make sure that decision makers know. So that, yes, we will be the first ones to go in, definitely. That's our job. But they have to be aware what they are sending us into. So, victim of our own success, yes. I think my recollection is right. That in the post-war period, there were more airmen than uh, ex-soldiers who became parliamentarians from the period 45 to 75, but I don't think it's that trend now. I'll just kind of leave that out there with you. There's a question here, and then across here. Thank you. Uh, hi, Sunu. Uh, my name's uh, Chris McInnes from the Air Force. I guess I just want to challenge you on that notion that our, uh, our leaders don't understand the importance of control of the air or having the ability to operate um, free of interference from the air. And I say that because if you look at the balance of government spending, we spend a bucket load of money on fighters and air warfare destroyers and electronic attack aircraft to achieve all of those things. And of all the uh, ADF capabilities over the last 10 or 15 years, probably the most politicised has been uh, air combat. Um, I haven't heard the, any either party talk about um, an air combat capability gap being permissible. So I think, I guess I just challenge that notion that our, our political leaders don't understand the importance of air superiority and, and, and the requirements of that in the future. And I base that argument purely on the amount of money that's being allocated to those particular capabilities. I'm not, uh, I'm not saying that the political leaders are unaware of the fact that we need air supremacy. In fact, I would say that uh, it's more relevant within the military forces, the other forces, including some people within the Air Force, take the fact that we have air superiority or air supremacy at the moment for granted. What I was trying to put across is that once you have a contested air environment, these combat elements that you talked about or air combat gap that we are trying to fill, those will have to come into play. And if you have to operate in two theaters, where uh, control of the air is being contested, I would go to the extent of suggesting that we may not be able to provide the kind of control of the air or air superiority that would make us comfortable. We may have a favorable air situation, and we will lose a lot of people trying to get that. That's all that I was trying to say. So don't assume it. The last time uh, the Australian army was attacked from the air was when in Korea where uh, most of the people who are now uh, doing this is, oh, was not even born. So that, that is a mindset is what I'm talk, trying to talk about. That don't assume it. We have to fight for it. We, and if you fight for something, you're bound to lose some part. You're bound to lose some people. Those are things that we have to accept. Exactly why, like what Raf said, zero casualties. Who can fight a war and have zero casualties? Are we joking? Uh, following on from that, uh, it's Morris Hall, I'm at the Tactical Data Link Authority. Um, 
we, we exercise to win. We exercise to not have casualties. We uh, reduce our, uh, our op for so that our, our air crew can go into a high end exercise such as Talisman Sabre and win with no casualties. Um, probably one of the best exercises I've done when I was in the Navy was we didn't know it at the time, but we trained and to lose the ship. We didn't know we were losing the ship at the time and the CO didn't and at the end of the eight or nine hours of damage control, they stopped the exercise and said, you've, you've lost the ship and the CO failed because he didn't recognise at that point that he was losing. So he was, you know, it was a call to make that, I've lost, so I'm going to abandon ship. Um, I, I think we need to look at our exercises and then train our aircrew to lose a and train our, train our, um, our commanders that, that you're in a losing situation here. And I know you don't have, we don't have the funding of that to put up, you know, 40, 50 aircraft and, and then have them start to get attrited. And then the next day you only have 30 aircraft, the next day you only have 20 aircraft, or you need to function with our AWACS because you lose valuable training objectives. But at some point we need to set up, so, uh, at a strategic level, a big exercise um, in that sort of South China Sea where you are contested against and where the opposition is actually winning and you are actually losing and you are losing people. And then the, the, learn, the learning outcomes from that that will get discussed are, you know, holy, holy crap, we can lose in the air. And we'll lose our assets and we'll lose our people. And, and what next, what do we do now? The scenario that you brought out in terms of uh, losing assets um, is particularly important for middle-sized or middle-power air forces. Uh, the problem that has to be addressed is the question of attrition tolerance uh, at the home front, at the political level, and at the unit level. How much of attrition can you tolerate and still continue to perform as a credible unit? That I don't think we have uh, deliberately done calculations on. And for a small Air Force, if you lose, say, I, I won't say in terms of percentages. We have got 100 aircraft, let's say, and you lose 20, that's a lot. Whereas a force with 700 aircraft, 20 aircraft, even if we have a one-on-one -on -one, uh, exchange rate with the adversary, that's nothing. How does one cater for this? So that is why we go towards technological superiority, conceptual superiority. We used to talk about the technology edge uh, way back in 70s, 80s, uh, from, from an Australian perspective. Then we started talking about the fact that we have much better command and control facilities. I, I would suggest that we have to go towards thinking in terms of concept edge and knowledge edge, because the systems that you have are pretty much the same. It may be built somewhere this side or that side, but the capabilities that the project are, uh, the difference would be like between 19 and 20, that's all. Uh, but what we have to do is to make sure that we have a concept, a knowledge edge, that decision superiority that we talk about, to be able to operate within the Aouda loop of the adversary at all times, not, not just at one time, at all times. We are perpetually within that uh, individuals or that entity's Aouda loop. Attrition tolerance is, uh, is a national uh, challenge. So we have an interesting issue already between national will and political will. <coughs> and a country that lost 60,000 people in the Great War is now concerned to have zero casualties and perhaps what we do now, showing a shift that I don't know has been properly be examined by historians, let alone by those who are planners for their strategic future. Would you please join with me in thanking Snoopers.